Welcome to Taking Care of Lady Business, where we put the business back in lady business. Hosted by Jennifer Justice, founder and CEO of the Justice Department, a management strategy and law firm that works with female and woke male entrepreneurs, executives, talent, brands, and creatives to build and maximize their wealth, focusing in the areas of tech, consumer product, finance, media, entertainment, and fashion. Jennifer interviews entrepreneurial women who have done it all, who will be sharing their secrets on all things business, especially as a woman. These highly successful women will share strategies and insights, including what not to do and what it takes to win. And now, here's your host, Jennifer Justice. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. Today, we have the lovely Henley Vasquez. Um, she is the co-founder and CEO of Fora. How are you? I'm doing so well. Thanks for having me on. Henley is sitting in the JFK airport lounge right now. And I yeah. think once she starts talking about what Fora is, you're going to understand why. So tell us about Fora. Yeah, the airport is a common place for me these days, actually, actually for most of my career, uh, because I am a travel agent. And Fora really grew out of my feeling that a lot of other people could be travel agents, in particular women, and they really didn't have access to this industry. Traditionally, this industry is one that requires kind of a full-time commitment, expensive training courses. Um, you don't really get in unless you know that this is a job and you're willing to do a lot to get there. And I felt like there were a lot of people, but in particular women, that were talking to each other about travel, giving recommendations on travel, really planning trips and leaving this money on the table. They're not getting paid for the work that they're doing. Then the flip side of that is their friends who are taking their recommendations, going to hotels, are often booking through OTAs like booking.com, Expedia.com, which really gives you the worst service you're possibly going to get. So it's a two-sided equation of both sides losing out, really. So we launched Fora in the fall, really with the goal of empowering anyone who loves travel to sell travel as a side hustle or as a brand new career. That's amazing. So how does that work? I mean, you know, what's an OTA, by the way? OTA is online travel agency. So think booking.com, yeah. yeah. speedy.com. So those places that a lot of people go to for a very quick booking, yeah. they take a very big chunk of commission from hotels. Hotels do not like working with them. So when you book through a place like that, you are prioritized below everybody else because they would really prefer that your business did not come that route. When you book through a travel agent, you're prioritized above everybody. OTA, bottom of the barrel. What about if you go directly to the hotel? weirdly below the travel agent. You would think that they would prefer the direct bookings because they don't pay any commission on it, but actually they incentivize travel to come through travel agents for most four and five star hotels. So we have partnerships with about 3,600 hotels at this point, where yeah. if you book through one of our advisors, you actually get a better deal. And that's because advisors are traditionally a better supply channel for the hotels. We bring better clients that are better matched up to the hotel. So I know what you like, what kind of place is going to be right for your kids. I'm not just sending you in to some random place. So you're more likely to be a happy customer. Also, we know from data that uh, clients that come through travel agents tend to spend more on F&B and book higher category rooms hotels love us oh so that's no it's super interesting because you know that was well I think that's kind of a common perception right that like the travel agent is going away because you can just do everything online so it's great to hear that and then so dig into a little bit more about what exactly Fora is and and how like if you love to travel how you can join this and in particular women because that is our audience yeah. So I think the interesting thing is that I see a lot of women going out there and becoming real estate agents when they have kids and they're looking for sort of meaningful part-time work. So the difference between becoming a real estate agent versus a travel agent is that real estate agents have to take a class. They have to pay for their own license. You have to spend your weekends wandering around someone's home. And how many houses are you going to sell? Probably not many. And yet there are millions of real estate license holders in the U.S., there are 100,000 travel agents. To become a travel agent, you just work with a host agency. So Fora is a host agency. There's no license that you have to get that's actually held by your travel agency. You become a user of that license and that's what enables you to book hotels or ground arrangements and get commission and also to get those better amenities and perks added to your clients' bookings. For Fora in particular, 
you sign up, you get yourself on the wait list. There are about 25,000 people on the wait list at the moment, Amazing. but um, you wow. can always let me know and I will prioritize you. And really what it is, is filling out a survey and saying, you know, what do I love about travel? How do I think I can build my business? The people that are most successful are not Instagram influencers. They are not, um, you know, people who are necessarily jetting around all the time. They're the people who have a great personal network that love travel and are excited to help their friends do their vacations, help their family do their vacations, book their own vacations, and are comfortable in that sales role. So that's really, I think, the, the nut of what it is, is that it is a sales role, but it's a really, really fun one with a great community around it. So what, how does it exactly work when you sign up to Fora? Like, I want to, I want to do it, right? And then how do you sift through who, if I'm the customer, who I work with? So how you get on as an advisor is you would fill out a survey that would produce a score. Depending on where your score is, we would either screen you further or you'd be automatically onboarded as a customer. So if you come on and you're saying, I really want to go to Paris and I want to find somebody to plan my trip, what you would do is go on to the Fora website. You can search through the profiles. We're really working on ramping up the technology right now. Um, we're only about seven months in to the site. So there's a lot more to be done, but essentially there's going to be tagging and sorting of advisors. So you can find people who are producing itineraries and content around Paris, for example, around Caribbean, for example, whatever you're looking for. So that you can find somebody who feels most similar to you. Cause I think we all know that whether it's travel or whether it's a new pair of shoes, whether it's, you know, which airline you're flying, you're often asking your friends for advice. You're not necessarily needing sort of a professional sort of advisor to tell you which are the best shoes you're asking your friend. And that's the same thing with travel. You don't need somebody who's done this for right. 25 years. You need somebody who understands what you want out of it. Right. And full disclosure, Henley booked my very first trip that I took alone with my twins who had just turned four. And right. I was like, we'll go to Mexico. And so we went, she recommended this amazing hotel, Essencia, and said like, everything that I needed. She's like, there's a little patio. So when they go to sleep, you can go chill. Like all the things they like, they don't really have like a kid's club, but they literally took my kids all the time. And they're like, okay, bye mom. And I was like, wait, where are you going? And they're like, we're going to go look at the peacocks, you know, peacocks um, and turtles <laughs> and turtles and feed the turtles and whatever it was they were doing and make um, sombreros and whatever. And uh, they loved it. And we had a great time and I actually really need to go back, but um, it, it is really helpful. But uh, you know, what about people who just like, I just want to go to Nantucket for the weekend. Like, do yeah, they so they can also, yeah, they can do that too. So think about a travel advisor as someone who, yes, can plan your whole trip, but it's also just a better way of booking a hotel. So like, let's say you want to go to the Nantucket for the weekend and you're looking at White Elephant. Find an advisor, click it. Really, anybody would be able to do this for you and say, I want to go to Nantucket for the weekend. So White Elephant, for example, is the place where not only is it a little bit complicated to book? So it's nice to have an advisor because there's certain parts of that hotel that don't actually have access to the pool. So if you're going with kids and you want that pool access, you need somebody to tell you that. And then you're also going to get better amenities. So if you called up the hotel and you said, I want to book this hotel for this weekend, the hotel might say it's you know, $600 a night. If I call up for you, it's going to be the same price. Plus you're going to have your breakfast included. Plus there's a hundred dollar credit. Plus I've worked really hard to have good relationships with all these places. And so they're going to take a better care of you. We're going to let yeah, them know yeah, what yeah. your kids' names are, any allergies, all of that. So it's really anything that an advisor can do. It's a straightforward hotel booking or it's a, you know, two week safari. Yeah. I mean, amazing. I think this is so enlightening even for me, you know, because so, so many times you're like, oh, I just don't want to bother anybody because I can just go on to, you know, xyz.com and then, yeah. And, you know, that's, a, I mean, it's a really good point though. And I think that's the one place, actually, there's so many places that this industry is really lagging behind in terms of tech, but that in particular is one that we're really working to address of building out some sort of interface where not only our advisors can do a point and click booking, but also that their clients will be able to as well, because it's true. You want those perks. You want the ability to book quickly as well. And sometimes that human interaction, although it can help you a lot, can also slow things down. So one of the other things that we train our advisors, we do a lot of training for them um, to do is to, to, sit, to let their clients know, like if it's late at night and you just wanna book something, your client can click and book it and then just forward it to them. They'll still be able to take it over is what we call and add those amenities later. So that is right. often the way that it happens is people are like, it was midnight, I got an idea, I didn't wanna risk losing this, I just booked it online. Then they just forward it to their advisor who then goes about the whole process of making sure everything's in there, they got the added amenities, the hotel knows what time they're arriving, take care of all of that. So we're gonna try and fix that and make it a little bit clearer a path with tech, but for now, there's still a workaround. 
And this, is this applicable to flights as well? Or is that just easier to book on your own? Flights are the worst. I can say that because I fly all the time. Um, airlines are really difficult. And I think anybody yeah. who's flying this summer knows exactly how complicated airlines are. They, your advisor can book flights for you. What we typically train our advisors to do, and obviously they're new to the industry, most of them. So we don't want them getting weighed down with stuff that's super complicated. We want them to focus on the things where they're they really sort of flex their expertise. Uh, we usually tell them, don't get involved in flights unless somebody really wants you to. So yes, we partner with a flights agency that can ticket your flights. Yes, I actually use them for my own personal travel. I think they're very good. On the other hand, there's a ticketing fee because there's not a lot of money to be made in booking flights. There's all sorts of things that you have to go through. So what I typically say to people is if you've got something complicated, if you've got something long haul, business class, first class, using the flight agencies are great. If you're doing like I'm doing and you're bopping down to Miami for a couple of days for a meeting, I just book it on myself on the app. Yeah. 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 It's really like, yeah, it can be really quick, sometimes quicker than even like a computer, like, you know, yes, just no, so much. And I, yeah. you know, there are moments where you're glad, like I was in Rwanda when my youngest got COVID and I was so happy that I had a flights agent that I could email and say, I need you to get me an earlier flight back, like figure out how to get me out of here. I have to get home. Um, but most yeah. of the time it's not really that complicated. Yeah. Especially when like you're doing 10 other things instead of like sitting in front of your computer. <laughs> exactly. Like, I'm trying to do it. All right. So you started this, it sounds amazing and everybody should be using it. And anybody who is, you know, part of the great resignation and not really sure what they want to do, but loves to travel. Right. Is that who your main like targets are those kinds of people? Yeah, I mean, our main targets are really anyone who loves travel and wants to be a part of this industry. We really want to open it up to other people. I think it's been far too closed off and that's yeah. kept it with a remarkable lack of diversity. So we really want to open it up to anybody who wants to do it. On the other hand, what we've seen as people who are really successful are often women, in particular stay-at-home moms, who their kids are getting older, they're looking for something to do, yeah. they still want flexibility. After the last couple of years, you know, what is a million and a half more women are out of work after uh, the yeah. pandemic. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who are done with the Zoom schooling and they want some meaning, they want some community, they want something fun back in their life, but they're also still caught up in a lot of what they have to do. So something that they can do like this between drop off and pick up, then something they can do from their phones as they're running somewhere makes a big difference. And that's really who we've seen is super successful, as well as those digital nomads who kind of like unplugged, took off to Costa Rica during the pandemic and are now yeah. living around the world, those types of as well. It's really great because they can flex what they know in order to turn it into additional income. And how long have you been thinking of this idea? Years, really? years, but I could, yeah, I could never do it before. And that's one of those things where I don't like to say there's a silver lining to the pandemic. There isn't. It's been terrible. On the other hand, it destroyed my boutique travel agency that yeah. I had. It really ate that business up and chewed it out. And what came out of it is that I said, I love this, but I want to do this differently. And I want co-founders and I want a bigger team around me. I don't want to be doing this just as a teeny tiny small business. I need people. Um, and I really want to figure out a way to make this industry a little bit more open to others to be able to find something in this too. And there'd been years where, you know, women would come to me and say, Hey, can I do your job? And I'd say, no, not unless you want to do it all the time. Cause it's not worth it to me to train you. There's not enough yeah. margins unless you're going to be like in it, like I'm in it. And most people aren't going to do that. But what we realized and what we needed to fundraise for is that if you built systems, created a platform and sort of pulled a lot of the, the hard work off, a lot of the admin I mean, the amount of time as a small business owner, I spent just chasing commissions from hotels. That's what agents do. We don't want them to do that. We'll do that. They should focus on something yeah. next trip. So if we pull that stuff off, we can create opportunities for people to sell a little bit of travel, a lot of travel, more when they want, less when they want, really have flexible work that is fun. Yeah. So you really did take that, that real estate model in line. We really did. I mean, look, I saw what places like Compass did in terms of enabling their agents with really great e-marketing materials, um, social support, ways to show themselves as professionals in their business and wanted to follow that. I think there's a lot of travel advisors out there who have great ideas is travel advisors and, and just general people, great ideas about travel. They're not professional Instagrammers. They don't know how to build a MailChimp. We need to give them those tools so that they can look like they know what they're doing because they actually do know what they're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so you had the idea forever. You just weren't ready. Okay, so was it like self-esteem thing? Was it a confidence thing? Was it a like money thing? Money money. You know how it is. It's money. Yeah. So yeah. I had tried to raise money back with my previous uh, company, Passported, and not really been very successful and found it really frustrating. 
and give it up a little bit. If God, well, this is it, you know, small business. This is, this is what I can do. I can't do any better than this. Yeah. And then what I found is that when I teamed up with the co-founder who had a background in fundraising and knew what he was doing a little bit more, it changed everything. And right. finding somebody who can be a true business, right? Two co-founders who are remarkable and finding people who can help you build that team that brings something different to it. So I knew a lot more about travel agenting than they did, but they knew a lot more about other stuff. And when you put that package together, suddenly VCs were interested in talking to us. They actually wanted to give us money. They understood where it was coming from. And I realized I hadn't really been articulating my ideas and I'd been a little scattered about it, um, but I wasn't really articulating my ideas in a way that spoke to them in their language. And that's what needed to happen. And then that just flipped the switch. And plus we found just great investors that really understood the industry and saw the need to evolve that agency industry. Cause a lot of people go like travel agents, do they exist, yeah. why? Well, exactly. Because they're like, they sit there and they go, well, you know, do we need them anymore? We have, right. Do we need them? Yeah. It's not scalable AI. I mean, the numbers of times people are like, can't they just replace travel agents with AI? And I'm like, no, AI will never know that your kids need a place to sleep so that you could sit outside and exactly. have a margarita at night because yeah. that's what's good to make this trip a vacation for you. Exactly. We need humans, but we need humans with better systems. Like, you know, tech enabled humans, but it's still, it, it's a human business. And we like humans. We like community after all this time of being apart, it's good yeah, to yeah, connect yeah. with somebody else. All right. So you went through the whole process. You raised some money to be able to launch, right? I mean, one of the things that I love talking about here is how women can give each other business and help each other thrive in there, right? Because that's the whole ecosystem that men created. They like, you know, they have business, oh, I'll give it to my buddy. They need to hire somebody, they hire them, you know, and it's the same. It's like, let's give each other business, we give it, which gives each other money and allows to have choices, you know, and to upgrade our lives and our power and our collective power as a gender. So, you know, because we still live in a capitalist society, we have no choice, you know? And so you said one of your co-founders, male, of course, because they can raise money a lot faster than they can. Women. Made a difference. And what about your third co-founder? What is their background? So he came out of FinTech, which was really important for us to have something that had a real technical side, but also really understood the financing and ways to kind of work with that. Because I think there's a lot that can be done just actually in the transaction along the way, once you get a little bit farther into this industry. Yeah, because you need that, like, but again, that balance too, right? So if you have a founder, like everybody's doing something different. And they have everybody's their- doing something different. And that's one of those things that I think we saw over and over is like, yes, it was two guys and me, but I wasn't the token woman standing in this room. I was the actually the expert. one coming in with the industry expertise. And they were the ones that were coming in different kind of expertise. So building that sort of diversity of understanding what kind of company you're building gave us the ability to really think about this in a much bigger way. I didn't want to build another travel agency like everybody else's. There's a lot of really good ones out there and we're not trying to compete with them. We're trying to steal market share away from OTAs. We're trying to give opportunities to people who want to work in this industry and haven't been able to. So our tackle on this was very different than other people's. And I needed co-founders that were looking at this differently than people who were already within the industry. It wasn't something where you could just partner up with somebody who's already doing it just like me. That was repetitive. Right, right. This is a whole new business model for the travel uh, business. Yeah. Reinventing the travel agent. That's the goal. I love it. And so you have, wait, you have a 25,000 person wait list. That's great. Yeah. So we grew really fast and that's both a blessing and a curse. So we closed our initial seed round um, last year. August, we launched our website in October, November. And for, speaking of referrals, like the, my first advisors that came on were a lot of my clients who were a lot of these women who they were referring their client, their friends to me to be more clients. And I said to them, guys, like you really know what you're doing. Instead of sending your friends to me, why don't you start doing this? I will teach you how to do this. And they're killing it. Like they immediately took off and started doing it. Then they brought in some of their friends. And so a lot of it became this group of women who already, who sort of were in my community already of traveling. And I was planning their trips. They knew exactly what they're doing. They didn't really need me. And they flipped it around and became people who had their own businesses. And that's really my goal. So we got that round of funding. Um, we launched, we grew really quickly. So we have about 400 advisors on the platform at this point, the wait list 25,000, and we're just figuring out what to do. So our problems now are messaging, branding, onboarding, 
scaling the training, like how do we accommodate all these people who are interested in this? Some won't, some won't succeed, but yeah. a lot will. And we're sort of you know shipping product, trying to get that out there as fast as we can. But there's still a lot of work to be done when you are this early in a business. Um, and we're sort of finding our ways that we go, but with this a totally incredible community that's been built along the way who are helping each other too. And that just warms and my making heart. making money and, you know, livelihood for people who weren't making money it. where the money was just sitting on the table or going to someone else. And yeah. one of the coolest things that I've sort of gotten as feedback so far is a couple of weeks ago, we got an email from an advisor and she said, I just paid my rent with my commissions. And yeah. she said, you know, I, I thought this would be kind of like a side hustle. I'd make a little bit of money and I just paid my rent with the money that yeah. you paid me. And the difference that that makes in my life is huge. And I'm having fun doing it at the same time. So I think go get it, girl, get the money. You've earned it. You're doing the work. Anyhow, all you have to do is flip that switch on where you actually are repositioning yourself as a professional in this. And suddenly this is additional income that kind of the sky is the limit. It's just how hard you want to work and how much you want to get. And it's so true. I mean, I love what you're saying about like some people were your clients and then you, and they were referring to you and they're like, no, 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 you take them because you know, that's the whole thing is like women are often asked to give up all their services for free. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, but you know, when, when people ask me for like, oh, can I get an intro, et cetera? I'm like, well, it just depends. Like I spent 30 years, like, you know, building up all of this network. Like how, why would I just hand something over, you know, when I can get somebody on the phone in five minutes, that doesn't mean I deserve less. Right. It's yeah. just, you know, in fact, it's probably more, you know, and so that whole thing of like paying it and paying it forward, which is what men do all the time. And they refer business. It's like, oh, here, you get a piece of whatever I make from that. Um, and this is one of the like main like mottos that I have in the justice department is like, if somebody gives you something where you have to get real value from it, they should get a piece of it, you know? And it's that whole referral because that is money when the whole kind of premise of the justice department started on that when Rebecca Minkoff and I went out to lunch and she was like, what is going on? Why aren't we as women as a whole in business, like really elevating? And I would say, look, every time I do business for a man and I get them a big check, a $5,000 bag arrives at my office <laughs> or a check, you know, for, as a percentage of it, you know, even though they have paid their own attorneys or whatever it is, I get something of value from it because they got something massively of value for it. It should not be a thank you or flowers. It should be like a percentage of what it is. And it's usually two to 5% of whatever it is that you got, you know? So you can imagine the check sizes of these things that I was giving. So, and by the way, that's happened. I've got a $20,000 Birkin bag from somebody once and I've gotten a hundred thousand dollar check. Like, and it's all from men. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so whenever somebody gives me referral business and it's like substantial referral business, you're going to get something from it. You're going to get something for it. Well, and I think I think women are uncomfortable talking about money. And that's one of those. We have to get we, over that. We have to get over it. We have to over normalize it. Things. And yeah. some of the, I do mentoring calls with our new advisors. And one of the first things that I talk to them about is that this is a sales job and you have to get comfortable appreciating yourself and your time and saying to your friends, this is my business. Please book your hotels through me. This is what I'm doing. It's going to help me. I'm going to make money off of it. I'm yeah. going to help you. This is how it works. And when they want more and it's more itinerary planning and you need to put a fee out there, you need to tell them what that fee is. And you need to charge that because they're going to be happy to pay it to support you and to get your help. But you have to learn how to talk about money. And I think that is very difficult for a lot of women, particularly women who may have been out of the workforce for a while. They yeah. probably can't go to back to a traditional job. They've been mommy tracked there. And when they're starting their own business, that's the first hump to get over is talking about money money, knowing your self-worth and being comfortable putting yourself out there in a sales role. Yeah. It's not only that. I think sometimes too, it's like knowing that if you're going to use a travel agent, you think you have to be super wealthy to do it, you know, and being like, look, I can't afford $800 a night, yeah. you know, yeah. in a hotel. Like, what do you have for me that I can afford? And not feeling embarrassed about that too. You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. Well, having those really frank conversations that I think it's, it's interesting because these are women who are really activating usually their local networks is that you don't really know what kind of money your friend has. They may have a lot more than you think. They may have a lot less. They may have a lot and not spend it on travel. They may not, they may be relatively modest in their lifestyle, but actually blow it out on travel. You don't know. And you have to be able to have honest conversations because that's how you're going to make an amazing vacation for these people. Yeah. You have to be comfortable talking about that and bringing it up. Um, and it's there, it's hard on them at first and then they get the hang of it. And then 
they're great. And I think, I hope that this carries over into the rest of their lives too. Yeah. Amazing. And so what have you seen from like yourself and as a woman in building these businesses, like what were the things that you think you did right? And some things that you did wrong in this? So I think it's interesting that it's a very, the travel industry is very relationship driven. Yeah. And, you know, I look at all of the times that I, I have, you know, wanted to go home and gone out to a cocktail instead to see somebody, how I've taken a phone call that maybe I was really busy, but I made time to fit it in. The relationships that I have built with our suppliers, it's at times really hard to do, worth every moment, every penny. First of all, they're amazing people and I love knowing people all over the world. Second of all, those are the relationships that then make it easier for my advisors to do a good job. Those are the people that I can pick up the phone to and say, hey, they've got a client coming in or this hotel is sold out, how can you help? And it builds that community. So the right thing was putting that extra, leaning in on the relationship building. The wrong thing was I think trying to do tech without a tech partner. I mean, my first yeah. business, I had all these ideas that I would build this itinerary platform and we didn't have anybody technical on the team. It was, just, it's, it was insane. And when I look back, I wasn't really following the money. I wasn't really following what I was good at and what the core business was. I was sort of dazzled by this idea of like technology and fundraising and we can do this and I failed. Yeah. And even the, the like humiliation of failing and wanting to hide that was something that I did wrong. I think I'm really comfortable now that I've sort of seen, okay, we did that. We went through it, the pandemic. A lot of us failed at the pan in the pandemic. Yeah. And being comfortable talking about the stuff that went wrong with other people so they don't feel so alone in it. But build the relationships. Don't be afraid to say when it's all gone a little bit sideways. I mean, that is a common theme amongst, you know, women in general. It's like, we, we don't want to burden people. Like we want to be there for you, but we don't want to ask anybody else. And then, you know, we try to do everything ourselves and it's obvious you can't, like, it's just yeah. not possible. And then, you know, when you do, it's like, then you, then you feel, you know, we're supposed to be 130% at all times just to look our best. We're supposed to, you know, we're supposed to be totally, you know, 130% prepared and like, you know, our male counterparts get away with so much that we don't. And then, you know, so then when you're trying to do something, you're like, there's just no possible way to win when you're trying to do it all yourself. No. And there's no possible way to win if you're holding yourself to that standard. If you yeah. can't possibly yeah. do it all. There, yeah. Like I will, I will forget things. I will mess things up. Yeah. I will do my best to keep the pieces together and I will get better at it. And that's another thing is just being in this first year of super fast paced growth, multiple rounds of fundraising. It is, it's mayhem. And I don't, I don't feel badly that I have no balance right now. I don't feel badly that things are falling apart a little bit at the edges that I'm forgetting to do stuff with the kids or yeah. I'm, you know, I didn't rush respond to that email. That is what this first year is going to be like. I accept it and I move on. And I just try to have more of a, a positive attitude looking forward and accepting what's wrong now, knowing I can fix it later. Well, yeah. And your first year is coming up. Can you believe it? I mean, it's like, I know I look back and I think, wow, we are, we have gone through, we've a lot in the past year. We have really, really built something that I feel really proud of, but we've still got a lot of work to do. No, of course. I mean, every, like, that's it. That's, I mean, that's always going to be the case, but um, no, thank you for sharing all of that because it is scary and, and, you know, you don't want to let it out there and be vulnerable that you might've failed at something or didn't know what to do because we feel like that's the, what the world is expecting of us as women yeah. in general. And so particularly you know. as mothers. I think there's yeah. this thing too around motherhood where I always laugh when I'm traveling, I get asked all the time by men, who's with your kids? And actually women do this too. Who's with your kids? And I'm like, their father is. No one ever asks a man on a business trip who's with his kids. And he might be a single dad. He might have his kids. Through surgery. No one ever asks a man who's with your kids when he's traveling. Women, I, women get to ask that constantly. And so yes. I think people are looking at mothers as though we're not going to be able to do it. And I think actually we juggle better, we time manage better, we yeah. sort of block and tackle better. There's a lot that we've learned through parenting and the insanity of that is that makes us actually very good at our jobs. No, and yeah, time management and like knowing what to prioritize definitely since, you know, I became a mom. And I mean, last week I went to LA, I went on Tuesday morning, I got to drop the kids off. I took that uh, like a 1030 flight you know, was there at 1.30, had a bunch of meetings. I had a panel thing I had to do, did the conference on Wednesday, left at 7 a.m. because it's 10 a.m. here. So it wasn't going to kill me to get up that early. And yeah. home by the time they were, you know, just got out of school. So it's like super easy and fast and, you know, 
yeah, we make it work and you make it happen. We make it work. <laughs> um, this is awesome. I'm really excited for you. And I'm, and I like that we talked a lot about like the business model of it and, and how hiring women and doing this is so much more helpful because I know I am to blame too and not calling you to book hotels because I'll just do the whatever it is, the OT, whatever you called it. No um, OTAs. OTAs. No, now I'm not, not going to do it you. anymore. <laughs> now I want you to book me a white elephant in Nantucket. <gasps> and um, everyone listening should be doing that too because it, it does make it easier. It's like, I have so much time. Why am I doing, you know, I like, I sit there and I have this podcast and I talk about all these things and then I like don't do it myself like all the time. I'm the worst. Um, but um, and so everyone needs to use it. And thank you for opening up for this process, etc. Um, but you are at an airport, and which means that there is time constraints, obviously, because they will not hold a plane for you, um, nor do you want it at this particular point since you <laughs> never know if the plane is actually taking off. Yeah, but, they often hold the plane for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there is one question I ask every single single person on this podcast and what is the worst advice you've ever received so the worst advice i've ever received is that there's something wrong with a lifestyle business like i think in the world of entrepreneurship people say the word lifestyle business kind of with a you know, sort of yeah. spit on the side to it. it's a bad word of the idea that somebody would create a business that isn't a super scalable venture backed you know next level unicorn I think that there's a lot of value in lifestyle businesses. And I think for women and particularly for a lot of our advisors, what they are creating is very much a lifestyle business and that's creating income and that's creating personal satisfaction. That's creating better vacations for themselves and their friends. I think we have to stop thinking that every job needs to be the next Facebook um, or that we need to work with yeah. that. And look, I've done the lifestyle business and I'm now doing a venture backed one with high growth and I'm happier right now in this one. But I think that we often speak about this word lifestyle business as though it's a bad word and it's a bad thing and that you're somehow not trying hard enough if you're in a lifestyle business. And that's just, I've heard it over and over again. I think you hear it a lot when you're talking to VCs and I think it should just be eliminated. Like What's wrong with that? Let people do work the way they want to do work yeah. and build a business that supports that. Well, yeah. I mean, and look, all these, you know, venture back businesses, we've all seen the super pumped and we crashed and, you know, et cetera. And it's like, they created really horrible human beings. You yeah. know, you might have a yeah. lot of money that doesn't make you a good person or a good human being or likable or, you know, a lot of things that, you know, people don't desire or for their children in particular, you know exactly. what I mean? And I, I just think, or by like, the way, we, profitable, how about or that? Or profitable, potentially not. But I think any I of them say... has any of them made any money, actually yeah. money. Like they made themselves a ton of money. They made themselves That's a lot of money, <laughs> a lot of money, their employees, unfortunately, who gave their life's work, not so happy, not so you happy. know? Yeah. I think we, we've sort of come to idolize this and look like, don't get me wrong. I want to build a billion dollar business. I do want a unicorn. On the other hand, I want to do that while enabling people to have lifestyle yeah. businesses that make them happy and fit into their lives. Yeah. Not the way that I tell them. Yeah. Should. I'm always like, be careful about that word unicorn, because guess what? Unicorns don't exist. <laughs> they did. My daughter would have invented them because she was like one unicorn and maybe rainbow stripe when she found out. <laughs> like it drives me crazy. It's like a unicorn. I'm like they don't exist. It's not like there's <laughs> one unicorn. Definition. Yeah, like exactly. Well, thank you so exactly. much. Okay, if people want to find you in Fora. How do they do it? Yes. Yeah, so the website is foratravel.com. If you're interested in becoming an advisor, just click join the wait list uh, and you'll be on the wait list. You'll get a survey right away. My Instagram is Henley V. If you are on that wait list and you are not hearing from us, just DM me and I will look into it. Um, and our Instagram is HelloFora. A lot of information on there as well about becoming an advisor, uh, what it has to do with it and just finding an advisor. Go on. If you want to book a trip, talk to one of these ladies. They're doing a great job. Amazing. Thank and men, so I should say that too. We do have some amazing no, course, male advisors course, too. <laughs> yeah, whatever. No, you're kidding. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. I'm Jennifer Justice. Until next time.